As I sit here on December 21st, 2021, drafting the script for episode 28, it occurs to me that it was 43 years ago to the day that John Wayne Gacy became part of my life. Now, I've told you a bit about my father and how he became involved in the case and how I came into possession of the rare historic tapes, which you've been hearing throughout the season. But I really haven't talked much about how this case affected my life. And as we race towards trial and the culmination of this season, which will end on episode 33, think about it, you'll quickly realize why that number was chosen as the end game. I wanted to take a moment to try and encapsulate how this sad and horrific case has impacted me throughout the years. As you know from earlier in the season, my parents were divorced at the time that my father was retained by Gacy to represent him. And I was living in Colorado Springs at the time, far away from ground zero which in retrospect was very fortunate for me as a fourth grader. As I've articulated throughout the season, this was a huge case, especially from the media perspective. And everyone in the Chicagoland area, parents and children alike, were aware of the case and who all the major players in the case were. And as we know, children can be cruel, many times just in being honest because they have not perfected the art of tactfulness and sometimes just because they have their own issues at home, which often get projected onto their classmates. So to say that I was lucky to not be attending elementary school in Oak Park during this time frame is probably a bit of an understatement. So from afar, I was kept apprised of what was going on with my father and the case by my paternal grandmother, Josephine, as she was my rock and my point of contact before, during, and after the divorce. Because, well... That's just who she was. She was never one to sugarcoat or mince words, and she loved me fiercely. So I would get weekly letters from her, which would detail all that was happening with the case and my father, and which would include clipped articles from all the local newspapers. I, in turn, started collecting the articles in a large gift box. And over the course of the year and a half that the case was going on, that box became packed to the gills with articles about the case, the creep, and my father. I would read the articles repeatedly, not so much because I was intrigued about the case, but because it was my lone connection to my father. These articles made me feel he was more a part of my life than he was at the time, or that he could be because of the distance between us and the time constraints that come with handling a case like that. It was a strange circumstance as a young boy to be proud of my father because of his newfound fame or notoriety, depending how you look at it. But I did, and I still do admire him, even more to this day for this major accomplishment in his life. I know, now more than ever, considering that I followed his path and became a criminal defense attorney myself, exactly the toll that a case like this takes on the lawyers handling the case. Now, state's attorneys, as far as they go, if they get the conviction, they're civic heroes. The defense attorneys, well, they always will lose in a case like this. If their client is convicted, he dies, plain and simple. And whether he deserves it or not, that does nothing to mitigate or dilute the fact that your client is dying on your watch. In the event that the jury would have found Gacy not guilty by reason of insanity, his attorneys would have been reviled as the men who aided a monster in getting away with murder. The hate would have been palpable. So any way you slice it, it was a lose-lose proposition for Mata and Amaranti. Oddly, the best case scenario for both my father and Amaranti was how it ends up turning out, at least in the court of public opinion. So yeah, those articles and my grandmother were my only connection to my father that I had during the pendency of the trial for a year and a half. So aside from the occasional phone call, that was it as far as my father went. Well, it's not exactly true. He did send me one cassette tape that he had recorded for me during the case, which, to be honest, I had completely forgotten about up until this moment. I remember very little with regard to what he said to me on the tape, but I clearly remember that the tape included animal stories, which was a little bit that a radio disc jockey named Larry Lujak and his co-host Tommy Edwards, little snot-nosed Tommy and Uncle Lair, used to perform on WLSAM radio. I'm not sure why I loved those stories, but I did, and the memory of them has stuck with me all these years. I just recall thinking of my father 
sitting by his shitty little radio in his room, his tape recorder in hand, recording these little episodes for me. It was a small act of love that had a major impact on me as a child. Eventually, the case ended, and two years after it was over, after a horrific custody battle, my father was given legal custody of me. So in 1982, I moved back to Oak Park, Illinois. And even then, kids apparently had long memories, because at least initially, I caught a lot of shit from my classmates about my dad being Gacy's lawyer. It never reached the point where I developed a complex, at least that I'm consciously aware of, but it certainly became a well-known fact of who my father was and what he had been involved in. And that has followed me throughout the course of my life. And that box of keepsakes that I would have loved to pass down to my children was lost in a flood in my grandparents' basement. So I was left with the memories and the tapes. Now, it's a bizarre thing to have a connection to a case like this, especially when I had no say-so in the matter. I can look back and see how in the long run I think this case affected my father, and I believe that it had a much greater impact on his psyche than he's willing to admit. I had hoped going into this podcast that I would be able to break through his mental armor to really get into the nuts and bolts of the personal side of handling the case and how it affected him. But he's old and he's stubborn, or maybe he's saving it all for a book that he's been threatening to write for decades. I don't know. So by way of necessity, this has become my story. And I must tell you that it has been cathartic to share it and the tapes with all of you. So we here at Defense Diaries want to wish all of you, our faithful listeners, the happiest of holidays. And if the holidays are a rough time for you, know that you have our sympathies. And we hope at the very least that this little show brings you some kind of respite, however brief it may be, to whatever ails you. And finally, if you've been wondering what the cover art is for this particular episode, well, I'm glad you asked, because it's your favorite time. And it's my favorite time. It's the Creeps hand-drawn Christmas card to my dad time. The Creeps hand-drawn Christmas card to that time. So in December of 1979, my father opened his mailbox and contained inside was an envelope addressed to him from his client, John Gacy. He slowly opened the envelope, carefully examining it, and contained inside was the creepiest yuletide cheer imaginable. It was a hand-drawn Christmas card from the creep himself addressed to my father and his then-girlfriend, Valerie, complete with a heartwarming quote from Twas the Night Before Christmas, which misspelled chimney as chimmy, which I always thought was funny. We wanted to share this nightmare before Christmas with you because, well, after all, you seem to enjoy dark shit. So, happy Christmas from us to you. To Defense Diaries. I'm your host, Bob Mata, and this is episode 28. Closest to danger, farthest from harm. We left off with Judge Garippa being assigned to the case, and with him gaining a stranglehold over the matter in only a matter of minutes, as he established without question who the alpha in that courtroom would be for the next year and a half. He ended up setting the matter over until January 30th which would be the next time that anything court-related would happen. Now, while nothing may be happening within the well of the courtroom itself, outside of the walls of the Leighton Criminal Building, there is a massive amount of activity going on. The primary focus of Dr. Stein and his team is to first and foremost identify the bodies. The challenge of using only dental and medical records is compounded by the fact that if the parents of a missing boy don't bring the records in, Stein has nothing to work with. Beyond that, there is a decent chance that some of the boys never went to the dentist or the doctor for anything of import. Thus, there are no records that exist. Additionally, 
There were various personal items, such as wallets, key rings, belt buckles, watches, bracelets, and clothes items that were recovered from the house that could also be used to help identify victims. Maybe, because even though a parent may recognize a particular item found at the house, that does not equate to law enforcement or the medical examiner being able to identify which set of the victim's bones in particular the item belonged to. Remember, at this juncture in mid-January, 29 bodies have been recovered, and only seven of those have been identified. To make matters even more challenging, it becomes more and more clear as the story continues to develop on a daily basis that there are a shit ton of people that survived a Gacy attack. So law enforcement cannot just assume when they find a wallet with an ID or a Polaroid of a naked boy that that person is dead. For example, we know that they found pictures of Robert Sipisic and Jeff Rignall contained within the photographs found in the creep's house, but they are alive. So Stein and the state are getting very nervous about the entire situation. That the next thing that they will be doing in order to try and determine the identity of the remaining victims is to attempt facial reconstruction. This particular task is out of Stein's area of expertise. So he is actively searching facial reconstruction experts from around the country. The experts will develop masks using pliable materials to attempt to show how the living person's face may have appeared. Now, while they may be able to come up with some version of what the victim may have looked like, including the sets of chins, mouths, and the shapes of noses, they will not be able to determine eye color or hair color. And this will be a time-consuming and costly endeavor for the state to undertake with absolutely no guarantee that it will actually help identify any of the victims. Now, we will be posting a letter slash pictures of the results of the facial reconstruction that was sent to my father from Gacy with some of Gacy's comments in the margins on our Patreon. It's pretty interesting and really helps drive home even more hate for the creep, if that's possible. So check that out. So as we continue to plow through January, the Cook County Sheriff's Police announced that they will be resuming the digging at 8213 Summerdale, either on the 27th or 28th of January. And this is interesting in light of what we had heard Judge Garippo tell the state in court back on January 10th with regards to them continuing the search at Gacy's home at its own peril, considering the unknown validity of the search warrants. Meanwhile, the media in its never-ending quest to uncover Gacy material to report on has discovered a now infamous picture of Gacy and First Lady Rosalind Carter, which was taken on May 6 of 78. Needless to say, the question of how the Secret Service shit the bed with respect to a background check on the portly contractor, which would have shown that the felony sodomy conviction existed and would have obviated any chance of Gacy being anywhere near the First Lady, has now become national news. A leak from the Displains PD informed the Chicago Tribune that in fact, the Secret Service had contacted them and asked them how they were able to ascertain that Gacy was a convicted sodomist. The leak informed the reporter that they had told the feds that they simply checked with the Chicago Police Department and they informed them of the charges, being that they had access to a national database, which Displains PD didn't. In response, the following day, the Secret Service told the reporter that they had, in fact, checked with the Chicago PD, among many other agencies, before Mrs. Carter arrived in Chicago, and that they didn't get the same information as the Displains PD had. However, on the following day, Assistant Director of the Secret Service, Jack Warner, told the press, when questioned, that the agency, in fact, failed to ask Chicago PD for a background check on Gacy even though they asked for checks on dozens and dozens of other people that were scheduled to come into contact with the First Lady. Oof, wrong guy to have slipped through the cracks. Somebody lost their job on this little blunder. Up in Lansing, Michigan, law enforcement is now taking a closer look into the cases of about a dozen missing boys from that area. They're doing this because it was confirmed that Gacy was known to have done several jobs in the Lansing area. Lansing police used the records of a company named PE Systems, which is an Illinois firm that employed Gacy as a subcontractor. And they were able to confirm that Gacy had worked in about 13 lower Michigan counties in 1978 doing pharmacy remodeling jobs. He was also known to have worked up there in late 1977. 
Now, after this story ran in a local paper in Kalamazoo, Michigan, the mother of John Prestige, who was the last seen alive on March 15th of 1977, and who was a native of Kalamazoo, Michigan, sent her son's dental records to the Cook County Sheriff's Police because her 20-year-old son, John, had come down to Chicago to visit a friend and find work with a contractor from Chicago. After receiving the dental records, Dr. Stein was able to confirm to Mrs. Prestige that her son John's remains, sadly, had been found in Gacy's crawl space. Also, 18-year-old Robert Winch, who was another native of Kalamazoo, Michigan, who had last been seen on November 11th of 1977, had also come down to Chicago. Robert had been living in a foster home and he had run away from that home because of issues that had arisen. His travels took him down to Chicago and ultimately into the waiting arms of the creep. Robert was known to have owned a distinctive tiger's eye belt buckle, which was found in Gacy's home. But the confirmation that in fact, Robert was a victim of Gacy came from medical records, which showed marks from a previous injury that had resulted in broken bones and which had healed. Stein was able to take these records and make the comparison and confirm that Robert Winch was in fact a victim of John Wayne Gacy. So the Lansing police put out some important feelers that directly resulted in two of the victims being identified, which also begs the question of whether the creep had made contact with these two young men in 77 when he was up in Kalamazoo working. The creep was a planner. Remember, nothing was happenstance when it came to his victims. When you traveled alone? No. Always with one other person. A lot of times with Rossi. Um, Ever with both of them? No. Either one or the, maybe one or the other. <laughs> yeah. Anytime I stayed in the motel, it was either with Rossi or with Graham. When they were with. Like on some jobs, when we went up to Wisconsin, there was four of us. All right, Rossi went up the room with me. Graham took the room with Michael Ferreira. Did the three of you ever go out together at night? Drinking? Yeah. Did the three of you ever go out together at night when we called John? Yeah. How often? Not too often. Did you go out with them individually? Yeah, I would say more so. More so with Cram than with Rossi. So then conceivably, uh, every time you went out at they night... Were out, they were out a lot together by themselves without me. So you don't recall specifically whether they were with you when you were out and picked somebody else up and brought them home. Conceivably, one of them could, one or the other could have been with you uh, on many of the occasions. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yeah, it's possible. What do you think about it? think it's conceivable? What's yeah, your but feeling about it? More, more so, more so there was, but there was more times that the two of them went out together. See, now, keep in mind, Rossi and Cram were not only the only two that went out of town with me. PE Systems would sometimes send me out of town either alone or with one of PE's representatives. PE? PE Systems. Hey, beautiful humans. Bob here. I wanted to talk to you for a minute about a sponsor that we absolutely love. And that sponsor is Shopify. And why do we love Shopify? Well, because they give small business owners and entrepreneurs the ability to be able to get their incredible products out to market with their own virtual storefronts and with only a minimal amount of effort. And then Shopify helps them become big businesses. Look, I'm dead serious here. Shopify has absolutely changed the game. As hundreds of thousands of businesses that may have never had the opportunity to get their products out to the public are now completely in the game. Brands like Death Wish Coffee, Magic Spoon Cereal, Gymshark all sell their amazing products through Shopify. And it's not just the small growing businesses that sell through Shopify. It's the big dogs too like Heinz and Mattel. But what else separates Shopify from everyone else that helps small businesses turn into big businesses? Well, 
How about because it's the number one checkout experience on the planet? Or maybe it's Shop Pay, which boosts conversions up to 50%. That means that less carts go abandoned and way, way more sales are happening. This is the bottom line. The businesses out there that sell more, quite simply, sell on Shopify. So upgrade your business and get the same checkout that Gymshark, Deathwish Coffee, Magic Spoon, Heinz, and Mattel use. So sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash dd. Again, go to shopify.com slash dd to upgrade your selling today. That's shopify.com slash dd. I can tell you this, as soon as our t-shirts and all our merch is ready, there's only one place on the planet where Defense Diaries is going to be selling their goods, and that, my friends, is Shopify. <laughs> They're employed. Both well, Prem and Rossi had keys to your house. Right. And they had access to it when you were gone. Yes. Well, conceivably, they could have brought somebody back there themselves. That's right. And you found people's property in your house when you returned from home. Yeah, because you there. see here, my neighbor across the street and my neighbor next door would, would tell me that well, there were cars in your driveway while you were gone or this was going on while you were gone. What neighbors? Grexa? On the one yeah. side, of course, Smith, I never talked to too much, but she was always bitching about people coming and going and peeling out of the driveway and shit like that. And the guy across the street. So, you know, the only, the only thing that I, I knew that, to, you know, with, with drug dealing, Cram, Cram was the big drug dealer. You know, he had all kinds of connections for anything and everything. And I said, well, what happens if they pop over here? They just take care of them. They have their own way of taking care of people. I call for them on drug deal. All of this time, then, they, they knew something was going on, either from you telling them, doing it with them, or them participating. I would say so, yeah. Although, now, backlash, that? backlash. I only got backlash from Rossi. Was there never from Cram? He never said he never, threat, he never threatened me. Michael Rossi did. Rossi put the threat across to me a couple of times that he could go to the police and, and implicate me. Did you ever threaten him? That you could implicate him? No. What about Cram? Did you ever say that you could implicate him? Well, I, no, you know, I think I think in general I told him that if I ever go down, they'd go down too. And Cram, of course, always put his attitude. Don't worry, they won't get nothing out of me. That was always his attitude. Do you think they got something out of him? I don't know. Do you think he talked about Zick? You know, about Ross, Rossi? Do you think Rossi talked about Zick? I don't know. I don't, I don't know... I know Rossi had spent a long time in that police station. Rossi claimed that he told me he had sex with me 50 times while taking a lie detector test. I know that some people are trying to say that Rossi and I were lovers or shit like that, but none of that kind of shit went down. Let's check back in at 26 and Cal on January 30th of 1979. The state, heeding the warnings given by Judge Garippo on the last date, has now filed a petition seeking to extend the five previously granted search warrants. At this juncture, the state's position is that the previously granted warrants had specified searches for various items, specifically the bodies of Robert Peast and John Sick, and also specified as much as they could for the search of numerous bodies or the remains both in the house and in the garage. As a result of those warrants and the excavation, 27 bodies have been recovered from the property, 26 from the crawl space, and one from the garage area. Now, the state contends that due to the nature of the excavation, that various alterations and work had to be done in order to execute the search warrant. Now, this is the polite way of saying that they have torn the whole damn place down. Walls, floors, ceilings, everything. Prosecutor Bob Egan tells the court that he had been out to the house on the previous day and that the only walls left remaining were the interior brace walls. He also informs the judge that the crawl space has now been excavated down from the original two and a half feet 
now to a depth of six feet in all locations. Additionally, a barbecue pit has been removed, and the house and the garage have been cleared of all of Gacy's personal property. All of it. Egan further contends that due to the unique nature of the situation, that the court should extend the search to include the entire premises of the property located at 8213 Somerdale. Specifically, the state is seeking to be able to excavate, probe, and tear up the L-shaped addition to the house, as well as the entire floor of the garage. He also advises Garippo that the state needs the ability to be able to dig and probe under the area where the barbecue pit was located in the rear yard, as the state has received information that the barbecue was not there when Gacy bought the house. Hmm, do you remember former Gacy employee and victim Tony Antonucci? Well, he has an interesting recollection about that barbecue pit area. So anyway, we were preparing for, he was preparing for one of these parties and I was, and this was the, the summer of, still the summer of 75. And he, uh, you know, did I want to do extra work? Yes, of course. So um, I worked at his house and he was going to build a barbecue pit and he was going to roast a whole pig in there because this was going to be the Hawaiian luau thing party. So I'm, I'm, I know quite a bit about construction now. So um, he goes, yeah, we're going to build a, a brick wall about, you know, uh, waist high, you know, they'll put charcoal and wood and stuff in there, blah, blah, blah. He goes, so you have to dig down a little bit to make a foundation to put these brick walls. And it's going to be, you know, like, you know, four or five feet wide, three feet wide, whatever this barbecue pit was. So I'm digging uh, to put the, you know, and going to form out to put the concrete for underneath this. And he goes, that's not deep enough. And I go, we're building a wall. It's only, a, you know, two two feet, three feet high. I go, you don't need a, you know, much more than a six inch foundation on there, but he, he wanted me to dig it deeper and deeper. And I dug this hole down in his backyard about, I don't know, like three feet, uh, which seemed excessive. You don't need a foundation that's three feet deep for, you know, a, a wall that's only going to be two and a half or three feet high. So uh, I kind of questioned why it was there. He goes, oh, there's going to be a lot of heat from the barbecue, blah, blah, blah. It's got to be thick concrete so it doesn't shatter and all this stuff. So anyway, he laid some construction uh, bullshit on me. And uh, so I dug it. And sure enough, uh, they later found uh, uh, somebody in that uh, underneath the barbecue pit. And I, I dug that. Uh, I dug that hole. I know later he had people you know, digging in the crawl space, but I think the crawl, this is all predated uh, anything with the crawl space, but yes, I did dig that. Um, I, I did, I actually laid the brick and everything uh, for that, uh, for that barbecue pit. As a matter of fact, I got kind of, kind of good as a, you know, masonry tuck pointer kind of guy. If you remember the brick front of the house, if you look at the pictures, because the house was just a frame house. It wasn't a brick house, but it had a, a brick facade on the front. I put that brick facade on the front. I mean, John and John Gacy and I did it, and there might even have been someone else helping it. But yeah, I remember we we worked to put that whole brick facade on the front of the house. And every picture you see of the house, I'm like, hey, put those bricks up. Now, Antonucci, unlike say Rossi, actually had no clue he was digging a grave for Gacy. Man. Gacy really was the epitome of evil. Egan continues with the state's request. He goes on to tell Garippo that they definitely need to dig under all of the blacktop, and he's also seeking leave of court to use a thermal optic probing device, which can detect gaseous production similar to what would be given off by a decomposing body. Egan tells the judge that if this technology is allowed to be used, that more digging may not be required. He also makes it a point to tell the judge that nothing that they are requesting to do in court today has already been done. He's doing this to make sure that anything that they find when the dig resumes will not be connected to the old, possibly invalid search warrants. Egan then takes a seat. Now, it's my father's turn to respond. And he starts by informing the judge that at this point in time, that Gacy's house is nothing more than a skeleton and that the state has gone far beyond what the warrants that exist and that are on file allow for. Mata asks the court to deny their motion on its face, 
as the proper approach would be for the state to prepare another affidavit for search warrant, which would state sufficient facts to support the request to dig up. Hey guys, Bob here. I want to talk to you a bit about investing. Yeah, you know that concept of making your money work for you? Yeah, well, I was always afraid to invest because I knew nothing about it. I didn't know how to enter into the market. I didn't know how to buy stocks. I didn't know how much money I needed. I didn't know if I had enough money. I didn't know if I did have enough money who I'd give the money to to invest it for me. I didn't know what kind of stocks to buy. All of the excuses that I had. And frankly, when I was young, I just wasn't thinking about retirement. I wasn't thinking that far ahead. And I wish that today's sponsor, Acorns, existed 30 years ago when I was in my 20s because I would have been in the market now at this point for 30 years. So what is Acorns? Well, glad you asked. Acorns makes it easy to start automatically saving and investing for you, your kids, and your retirement. And guess what? You don't need a lot of money or expertise to invest with Acorns. In fact, you can get started with just your spare change. Acorns recommends an expert-built portfolio that fits you and your money goals, then automatically invests your money for you. And now, Acorns is putting their money into your future. Open an Acorns Later IRA and get up to a 3% match on new contributions. That's extra money for your retirement. How cool is that? Look, guys, long before Acorns was a sponsor of our show, I was using Acorns to invest my money. I thought the concept of using spare change from transactions to invest in the market was so ingenious that the minute I found out about it, I signed up and got an account. So if you were like me and you were hesitant about getting into the market, forget all that. Dive in with Acorns. Let them do the work for you. Let them do the research for you. Let them be your guide into investing your money. I did years ago, and I couldn't be happier. So head to acorns.com slash DD or download the Acorns app to start saving and investing for your future today. Paid non-client endorsement compensation provides incentive to positively promote Acorns. Investing involves risk. Acorns Advisors, LLC, and SEC Registered Investment Advisor. View important disclosures at acorn.com slash DD. All that they are now requesting. My father agrees with the state that using the thermal optic probe if in fact it could lead to the state not destroying what is left of Gacy's property, could be an answer. Egan then gets the last word, where he proceeds to tell the judge that due to the fact that they've discovered 26 bodies in the crawl space, <gasps> but before he can finish, Garippo cuts him off, telling Egan he doesn't want to hear his closing argument. He wants him to answer the question, which is, are the areas that the state is now seeking to search part of the original search warrants? Yes or no? It's that simple. Egan states, uh, not specifically, but the property address of 8213 Somerdale is a part of the original search warrant, and the state's position is that that would include the entire property. The old man calls bullshit on this point, repeating Egan's own admission that the areas sought to be searched are not specifically named. Garippo inquires of my father whether it's the defense's intent to file a motion to quash the warrants. Mata answers in the affirmative. In light of this, Garippo states that because the weather is still brutal and the dig will not continue until the weather breaks, he wants to litigate the issues formally. He has absolutely no desire to extend an invalid search warrant. So after some more arguments about the potential effects of delaying the search, Garippo cuts it off and sets the matter for hearing on February 16th. And then, the most significant event of the entire day happens, almost completely under the radar, at the very end of the hearing. Bob Egan informs the court and the defense that the state is filing an inventory of things seized in a search resulting from the search warrant of December 13th, prepared by none other than Lieutenant Joe Kozenzak. And right there, sitting at number 12 on the property inventory sheet, shining like a piece of gold, is the planted photo receipt. Kozenzak, at this point, has now officially committed a fraud upon the court. And no one is the wiser that it happened. Well, almost no one. So there it is. That is how the photo receipt became a part of the court file, how it came to be in existence. It will never be reflected in any other document filed or tendered by the state because it doesn't exist 
in any other document that was prepared by anyone other than the one that was just filed in open court. Now, I'm curious as to why they had Egan file it instead of Sullivan, who was also present in court. Maybe it's because Egan has no connection with the Displains PD, nor was he aware of any of the details of the investigation that took place from December 11th through the 21st. But Sullivan was. He was there for all of it. Plausible deniability on the part of the state? Maybe. Or maybe it was just happenstance that Egan filed it because he happened to do most of the talking on this day. Which is also interesting, because it would seem that Sullivan, the prosecutor from the 3rd District who helped draft and review the early affidavits for search warrants, would have been the guy that would have been arguing on this day. Because, after all, how could Egan possibly know more about the first warrants than Sullivan? Simple answer, he couldn't and didn't. It's very curious indeed. So, Garippo adjourns court in the matter of the people of the state of Illinois versus John Wayne Gacy and holds the matter over until February 16th. Now, Garippo has given the defense seven days to file its motions to quash the warrants, so my father leaves the courthouse and immediately is off to start researching and drafting the motions in his little office in Oak Park. Back at the medical examiner's office, Stein has been able to identify three more young men through dental records. The first one being Robert Gilroy, who had been missing since September 15th of 1977. Also identified was Michael Bonin, who had last been seen on June 3rd of 1976. And finally, Russell Nelson of Cloquet, Minnesota, who was last seen on October 17th of 1977. Man, the torture those families must have been going through. It's just unbearable. In Sagamon County, Illinois, authorities are investigating whether or not a young man named Robert Mann of Riverton, Illinois, who was found in the Sagamon River on July 24th of 1977, is a potential victim of Gacy's. As the case has been cold since the body was discovered. When the body was discovered, interestingly, it was only clad in underwear much like many of Gacy's victims. But what really piqued the authorities' interest in looking into the creep is that apparently a map was found in Gacy's car during the first search on December 13th, and circled on that map was the town of Riverton. Now, despite the seemingly crucial circumstantial evidence, the authorities are acknowledging that the evidence connecting man to Gacy is thin. But what bodies discovered in the river any river, if Gacy hasn't directly stated that he threw them in, isn't then. I mean, as far as we know, the only two that Gacy has admitted to throwing in the river are Robert Peast, who has still not been located, and Joe Mazzara. That's it. Dale Landigan was discovered in the river. Gacy had denied killing Dale, but then they found his wallet in Gacy's home. So that was enough to attribute Landigan to Gacy. What it seems to be boiling down to here is that a river body is only going to be attributed to Gacy if either he, one, admitted killing the victim, or two, something belonging to the victim was discovered in Gacy's house. Man, that's a wide berth. And it seems just as likely that some of these other river bodies are also Gacy victims, as it is that they aren't. The bottom line is that the state has zero incentive or desire to dilute the strength of the case as far as probable Gacy victims go. So if there isn't strong circumstantial evidence or a confession by Gacy, they're not injecting these iffy cases into the mix. Because one shit case tucked into the middle of the rest of the stronger cases could lead to other potential acquittals on some of the weaker cases. Now, you may be sitting there saying, why does it matter? The guy is getting executed out of the way. Well, it matters for the families of the victims. They deserve closure. They deserve justice. And Bill Kunkel is not willing to risk that on potential victims where only flimsy evidence exists. And I get it. I really do. But it sure seems likely that that approach may have led to more Gacy victims not being identified. It's a tough call, but maybe 
it was one worth taking. Robert Mann's case, by the way, still remains unsolved. Well, it was, it was simply the issue of A, they were on the confessions one way or another. B, uh, there was a bond slip, and there, and there was uh, C, there were all the connections on body number one in terms of the uh, concrete over the, the, bur- the burial and so forth. Uh, and it's all part of the picture of the acceleration and the reason for the killings. If you think about it, even though I agree that the details of the story are probably mostly nonsense, uh, it wasn't it wasn't the typical rope trick. It wasn't uh, any of that. It was strictly a stabbing in the chest. And in my view, that's when he discovers uh, how much he enjoys uh, the power of deciding life and death and performing an execution. It is benefit, uh, and starts the ball rolling that resulted in the next six or seven years of, of conduct. Now, I think there was a number two. I think it was the one in the yard next to the driveway, uh, but that, that's an unknown, and so we really don't know any details about that one. So I, I think that one fits in next, but, but we don't know anything about it, so it doesn't add or detract from where I'm going, and as you'll see in a minute. Number three is Sen Butkovich, uh, several years later, in se- all the way to 76. And Butkovich is a big dispute, the first one that night, being in front of uh, not only Butkovich and Casey, but Butkovich had two drinking buddies there with him at Casey's house when they are having this big argument about how much, if any money, Casey is in arrears relative to Butk- Butkovich's uh, earnings. And then... After they leave the first time, then Gacy goes back later, according to his own statements, and, and finds Butkovich in a tavern alone and gets him to go back to the house, uh, gets him in the handcuffs, and while he's in the handcuffs, Butkovich says, when I get out of these handcuffs, I'm going to kill you, you son of a bitch. This is according to Gacy. And he goes ahead then, and for the first time, or maybe the second time, in my view, uses the carrot and uh, strangles him to death. But again, it's part of a physical altercation. It's part of a of what you might call a quote clo- rational close quote, quote motive, as opposed to just killing for the sake of killing, which is what's going on later with some of them at least, uh, or combined with you know his predilection now and his love of having the opportunity to exercise what he believes is this godlike power of deciding who will live and who will die. And I think he got off as much uh, on making the decision of some of the living victims. Uh, the guy in California that had the news around his neck and so forth, uh, to decide to let them go, uh, William Donnelly, to decide to let them go, as he did with the ones he decided, I'm going to kill this one. And from that point on, from Butkovich on, now you don't have the so-called, quote, rational, close quote, uh, motive, uh, any more at least than in any cases. I think he was very worried about that individual being one that might go to the police might cause him problems one way or another uh, and needed to be killed for that reason. Uh, but I think this, the desire to do it was uh, overtaking uh, uh, all those so-called rational uh, motives completely by the end. But, uh, but that's how I think the beginning started. So, you know, I think that sequence, you know, makes sense. Uh, the psychiatrist talked about some of them. Uh, and lo and behold, in Russ Ewing's book and in other of his rambling jailhouse uh, tapes and stuff, he... Uh, we pretty much admitted that. Uh, my view has always been there's absolutely, literally no evidence, uh, good, bad, or indifferent evidence, for any killing beyond the 33, with this exception. And the exception is his own statements, which makes it, you know, uh, problematic to begin with. But he claimed in his statements that he had put five, not four bodies, in the river. Uh, that the first one uh, was someone that he put in the river, and that when he dumped them over the side, he didn't dare a splash. And he was very concerned that perhaps it had gotten hung up on the superstructure of the bridge and would be immediately discovered. And so he jumped in his car and got the heck out of there. And then, lo and behold, when it wasn't discovered, uh, his new disposal method uh, was, was working. So he went ahead and used it four more times. Now, whether he, and he had been inaccurate on his sketch that he made in the, in the cell for uh, Albrecht and Feiner. Feiner, as far as the actual total number, he was over 30, but whether it was... 32 or 33, you know. So he's never been 100% accurate on the total. So whether he's 100% correct and that there were five in the river as opposed to four, who knows. 
And the, and the sub-theory, of course, always was that because of all that traffic under that particular bridge to the refineries and other industry in that area, plastics plants and so on, uh, there were a lot of oil and coal barges going under in long barge trains under that bridge. And particularly the coal ones are kind of like a pyramidal shape, uh, drawn out rectangular pyramid shape. Uh, if he landed on one of those, he could be on it and then in a storm or further down the river or bump into a, you know, a body or something, uh, the body takes loose and falls off and no one ever sees it and it's anywhere between there and New Orleans. We are now jumping ahead to February 16th of 1979, which is the most critical day in court in the case against Gacy, as the motions to quash the arrest and the motions to suppress are both going to be argued. Whatever happens with respect to these motions will determine if a killer walks or if the evidence will stick. So let's get to it on the next episode of Defense Diaries. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't give credit where credit is due. To my friend and my executive producer extraordinaire, Darren Wood. Thank you, D, for making it all come together. To Taras and Ryan Gack for your haunting and beautiful music that sets the scene for every episode. To Alex Carver and Corey Ridings that give our podcast something to look at. To Allison Mata, who makes everything behind the scenes happen to our wonderful sponsors that help us keep the show going, and to our network, Cloud 10 and iHeartRadio. Thanks for having faith in the pod. And finally, to our beautiful patrons, who I know some of you are owed goodies, and we got you, I promise. And finally, finally, to all of you, our faithful listeners, thank you, because without y'all, I'd just be an old man talking about an old case. Talking to you next time. Thanks, man. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks, man. Appreciate you. Friendly reminder to follow, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts and whatever platform you listen on, if possible. Also, follow us on Meta and Instagram at Defense Diaries and on Twitter at Defense underscore Diaries. And also on TikTok at Defense Diaries Podcast. So make sure you check it out. Okay, we know where the body's at. We know exactly where the body's at.